Sport Team for Eastern and Southern Africa and the UN Eminent Person for Women, Girls and HIV AIDS in Southern Africa. She has been involved in the response to HIV AIDS from the start of the epidemic in Botswana. As a former member of parliament and minister of health in Botswana, she led a successful national HIV and AIDS prevention, treatment, care and support program. As chairperson of the Southern African Development Community, or SEDEC, and African Union Ministers of Health in 2005-2006, she provided leadership in adopting the SEDEC Malaria Eradication Program, the SEDEC HIV AIDS Plan of Action, and the Maputo Plan of Africa on Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights. She funded the Botswana chapter, chapter of the Society of Women and AIDS in Africa and represented Eastern and Southern Africa on the board of the Global Fund. Dr. Klu is a former professor of nursing at the University of Botswana and a former director of the WHO Collaborating Center. We are very proud of you, Sheila. The WHO Collaborating Center for Nursing and Midwifery Development in Primary Healthcare for Anglophone Africa. Sheila has received several awards, including the Botswana President Order of Honor, the Florence Nightingale Award from the International Red Cross Society, and the Trailblazer Woman Leading Change Award from the World YWCA. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Sheila Clue to the stage. Thank you very much, Margaret. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, after all that, um, and I know already the time is up, I'll try to be as brief as possible, but I do have to say I am so happy to be back here in Washington, D.C. I used to go to school here at the Catholic University of America, and it is where I was taught the basic principles of public health that are, were applicable then as they still are now. It is here too that I was taught Catholicism, but became a Catholic who practices evidence-based Catholicism. So we'll talk about that. I want to recognize the people who went before me. I mean, after that performance, what more do you want? Nothing. However, being an actor, I know there's something that didn't happen yesterday. And uh, as an African, you know, I've missed it. And I know as black people, black people who are here, they've missed that last night. We just did not have enough singing. So for my brother, for my brother there, Phil Wilson, after what you said, I will say a prayer. A brief prayer that will take just a minute, then I'll go on. God of our weary years, God of our silent years, Thou who has brought us thus far on the way, Thou who has by Thy might brought us into Uh, let me, usually the slide, I want to first recognize our ministers who are here. You know, the ministers from Eastern and Southern Africa, the ministers from Sub-Saharan Africa who are here, as well as the Deputy President of the Republic of South Africa. This shows leadership with a commitment 
and we are very proud of you because only when you are here can you be able to interact and really know where the epidemic is going and therefore we don't have to do a lot of advocacy. It's right there. This slide normally goes at the back, but you know, I've addressed conferences before. The nicest I ever addressed was the ICASA in Kenya, where I simply told people, this is just, I, I left the professor at the hotel, what is before me, before you, is a village woman. That way I was able to go anywhere I wanted. Why? Because I was a civil society person. So on that point, I want to salute all the members of civil society who are here. I was brought and bred in civil society, and I'm saying, keep on. We are not there yet. Keep on civil society. And indeed, this presentation, which I'll have to go through very quickly, because in any event, Anthony Fauci and uh, uh, Hillary Clinton and the other speakers really uh, put uh, you know, a lot on our table. These are the people who donate, who, who, who contributed. I was so excited getting this invitation that I sent it to everybody, including Facebook, and said, what should I do? And all my 5,000 Facebook friends contributed, members of parliament, everybody. I could write a book, so I'm just waiting for Peter Piot to teach me how to write one. Is that thing? Yeah. So, uh, but I want to recognize two new keys on the block. The Global Power Women Network Africa, which is uh, newly formed, and I know our, the, the, the president is right here, Dr. Togozani Kupe from Zimbabwe. This is an organization made up of members of parliament, ministers, and all those top women in the continent who are now going to work with the African Union our presidents to ensure advocacy, to ensure that everything that was talked about here, that country ownership, shared responsibility, mutual accountability, it actually realized. So we see them as a very powerful uh, organization. And of course, the Pan-African Positive Women's Coalition, an affiliate of ICW, which is to be launched here, which really will now synthesize the problems and the needs of the African women and be able to work with the African Union uh, Commission to articulate the needs of HIV-positive women in the continent of Africa. That map has already been shown. I won't go into detail into it. It does show how affected we are. However, I must also say that that map also shows that people are alive. You know, it could be actually quieter, meaning that the people have died. People are alive, they are on ARVs, and we want them to die of old age, just like everybody else. We have done a lot. We have done a lot in Africa, and I'm not going to go through all the things, but we have already, uh, to simply say that in less than a decade, HIV treatment has actually increased more than 100 fold. And yes, the orphans and vulnerable children are now receiving basic education, health, and social protection. We have partnerships, but more and more, Africa is owning the epidemic. Actually, ownership of the epidemic is not a new concept. You know, I still remember 1996, the Vancouver Conference, where it was said hope. But for us in Africa, we knew that, well, it probably wasn't hope with the prices the way they were, when the prices sort of reduced, the scientists were saying, ah, it will never be done in resource-limited settings. They don't have the scientists, they don't, they don't have the, the facilities and all that. And uh, I'm glad to say that in 1998, after the AGT 076 study, we talked to our president, Muhai, who is here with the champions for an HIV-free generation. And he said, it was just one study done in Thailand, and we told him that it has been found to reduce mother-to-child transmission. And he said, if he can save our children, we'll also do that. That was leadership, bold leadership, because at that time, his counterparts were still wondering whether HIV even causes AIDS. Now, here was a man who was saying, we are rolling out. And in 1999, Botswana started the rollout of services to prevent mother-to-child transmission, the first country to do that. 
When I became Minister of Health in 2004, my predecessor had already rolled out enough that mother-to-child transmission was going down. But between 2004, because now we're able to really roll out even to the rural areas, we brought down mother-to-child transmission from around 35% all the way to less than 5% within four years, showing that yes, it can be done in Africa. As the Honorable Son of Africa once said, yes, we can. And we were able to show that yes, we can. The same thing happened with ARBs. Botswana by 1996 had rolled out to more than 8% of the population under the old uh, WHO guidelines. So that brought about now an impetus in Africa where, pe you know, uh, and of course they, they, with the partners, we were there with the partners, but I must say that even before PEPFA arrived, partners such as the Botswana Harvard Partnership were there. Acha, the Bill and Melinda Gates, and the drug companies, Med, Rizlmeyer, Squibb, Boringa, were all there. So that by the time PEPFA came, country ownership was ours, and we were able to say we're moving from here to there. Even when they said, well, we don't support condoms, we said, fine. We took the money, took it to the Ministry of Education, took our own money, and bought condoms. It was as simple as that. So we have been able to come far. But And Africa has been able to come, to, to come very far, but we have challenges. The challenges have been very well articulated. We still have punitive laws, gender inequality and gender-based violence that we have to deal with. Because in the ultimate, science and behavior, yes, but we need the environment that supports that positive behavior. And we still have to calculate that. However, there was that realization last year when our leaders uh, got together in 20, 2011 at the United Nations General Assembly high-level meeting on AIDS, uh, the global community was there, all the global leaders, and there were three products. The Security Council Resolution, the global plan towards elimination of new infections among children and keeping their mothers alive. I like that part. And keeping their mothers alive. And of course, the political declaration on HIV and AIDS, which came out with 10 targets. There are the commandments. You know, they, these are the commandments for an HIV-free generation. These are the commandments who was getting to zero. It's as simple as that. One, and I'm sure you can read them, but I'm not going to go through them because I take it as AIDS activists, we already know them. Anybody who, who raises their hand, I'm going to say, like Hillary Clinton, let's check our house. However, I'm going to highlight some of them. Uh, eliminating new infections among children. Of the 330,000 babies, 300,000 are in Sub-Saharan Africa and in 22 countries. And those are the countries that at UNAs we want to work with to ensure 90 to 90% coverage, but not including Nevirapine. Last year, civil society was very clear, say no to single dose Navarapin, and I'm pleased to tell you that a lot of our countries are actually moving towards option B, but they're actually now considering option B plus because Malawi has already rolled out option B plus, meaning that women are accessing ARVs throughout their lives. They can breastfeed, they can live longer, and it's, it's great. They have the human right to be alive. So we're hoping that we will work with the international uh, you know, uh, community because in the ultimate, we do need to have maternal mortality. Having is a good uh, objective, it's a good goal, but left to some of us, we'd be saying eliminate maternal mortality because in the ultimate, we know that there's a lot that we can be prevented. So we'll have maternal mortality, we urge, we work with countries to do that, and to say option B plus is the way to go, and no country or no woman should settle for less. It's as simple as that. You know, in our debate, I've been here two, two days already, I've been talking all over the place. One of the debates was, well, what about the cost? And in me, I said to them, well, you know, if men were the ones getting pregnant, would we really be wondering about the cost of Epstein B plus? I don't think so. 
we wouldn't be wondering. And it's in the same manner. Yeah. So just because it's women who are saying cause, no, women have the right to be alive. It's a right. They have the right to, 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 to nurture their children, to bring them up a bube and her mother. So well articulated it yesterday. So let's forge ahead, civil society, advocate for option B+. Plus. We'll be right there. So here we are. Are we close to getting there? If you look at that dot, you will see that, yes, with concerted efforts, country, you know, ownership and shared responsibility and global solidarity, we will reach that zero mark. What about reaching 15 million people with ART? 8 million right now and 6 million in, in sub-Saharan Africa, a 22% increase. And the most the dramatic progress was in South Africa, Zimbabwe, Kenya, countries that are in sub-Saharan Africa. But we know, of course, that Botswana, Namibia, and Swaziland have long achieved universal coverage. And it is already showing that treatment is prevention in that that has actually uh, resulted in reductions in new HIV infections. So yes, if you look at those graphs, AIDS-related deaths versus putting people on ARVs, those graphs are going to cross, but we think with enough effort and everything, we will get to that, to, 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 to that thought. Uh, here is the problematic one. Reducing sexual transmission of HIV by 50%. We are still having people infected. Granted, less than what used to happen, but, you know, infections have declined and the, the, the declines have happened especially among young adults. But as this juncture, at this juncture, I want to say we can do more. If we can have youth access, comprehensive sexuality education, that's the way to go. Young people, young people have the right to decide when, how, and with whom to have sex. And we are depriving them of that. So that now we do have young people who are pioneers, who are champions, who are really saying we are going to crowd out AIDS and claim our rights. And as adults, the adults who are here, it is high time we accept that young people are not the leaders of tomorrow. They are the leaders of now. Yeah. So where were we? We were not online to achieve this. I really don't think so, but with concerted efforts, maybe in 2015 we'll be able to assess where we are and to say we are nearly there, but we want to be there. But we have to remember that much as we're saying treatment is now prevention, we cannot treat ourselves out of the epidemic. You know, here we are. That line is going completely parallel to that dot, but we'll bend it. Let's ensure together we bend it a little bit, eh? We'll get there. Priority actions, we have already talked about that. Know your epidemic, know your response studies. UNA is, is, is working with countries on these studies. You know, there is something about evidence that hits you right in the face, bah! You can't ignore it. Any one leader who says, oh, we, we don't have homosexuality, you know. We simply say, well, here is the prevalence among men who have sex with men. Here is the prevalence among sex workers. You can't dispute those facts. We have to, be, so that we really need now to scale up. We need the investment framework, we're using it as a tool to scale up all those um, services. But not only that, to ensure that in the scale up, we have other aspects. For example, critical enablers, access to housing, access to education, zero tolerance for gender-based violence, gender equality, things like that. So we, 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 we need a lot of work on this, on this one. But we have to ensure the investment framework is raised, really says that let's look at what is working and scale it up. And let's reduce what doesn't seem to be working. With the little money that we have, we can be able to do that. And uh, PrEP now is a component of combination prevention. We have had Anthony Fauci. I am really glad of the, reg of the registration of, um, uh, by the FDA of, of Truvada. My appeal is simply to say that it was tested in populations in our region. 
Therefore, populations in our region should be some of the first to benefit from that. Yeah. Failing that, failing that, it gets to be labeled as one of those guinea pigging things. So we need that kind of advocacy and we're hoping we'll soon be seeing true vada on our medicine stands and, and, and on all that. Yeah. To end AIDS, we need a bold leadership. We need a bold leadership that I just said before. Yes, a political uh, leadership that, has just, that was described in Tunisia. You know, before, when I used to talk as a Minister of Health, they would say, well, you, Sheila, you are scaling up because Botswana has resources. And I would say to them, no, Botswana doesn't have any more resources than any other African continent. We have political will and commitment. Prudent spending, good governance, zero tolerance for corruption. I said those four ingredients are the ones that are forging us, making us further ahead. So this year, it was said by our ministers of health and finance at that meeting, I could have kissed them. Because they now, for the first time, said they need good governance, zero tolerance for corruption, and they will be able to, with, that one, with those ones, they'll be able to ensure that the resources well where they are most needed. That's really great. We need leaders who can tackle the taboo topics on sexuality, you know, and shy away from phrases such as, you know, well, we'll, we'll, let, let's say family planning. You know, it's very interesting. You know, I, I don't have a problem with the word family planning, but I get a step in all the wrong places when you are using that for young people that you know are actually say contraception, or for anybody else who wants to just enjoy sex. We should have access to sexual and reproductive health commodities, period, for the complete enjoyment of sex. I'm a middle-aged woman. I have long had my children. I, I, I'm not planning, planning any family, but I have the right to have stay safe, sex, when, how, and any time I want it. So really, when you tell me family planning, it just doesn't make any sense to me. No. So let's talk about sex. Let's talk about sex and sexuality and know that it is a God-given thing and we can't shy away from it. We need leaders like that, and we still don't have them yet, but we will cultivate them. They are coming up in Africa. We are there. And the Global Commission on HIV and the Law did say that. They said countries should enforce laws against all forms of child sexual abuse and sexual exploitation, but should differentiate those laws between, between discriminating people because what some African leaders right now are saying is, okay, uh, you know, we don't want men to have sex with men because they are luring uh, children to, 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 into uh, uh, being, being homosexuals. And we are saying, no, a pedophile is a pedophile. Amen. Whether he's a heterosexual or a homosexual, that should be punished. But any act of consent, sexual consent between two adults should not be punished. So we should differentiate between the two, and I'm glad the Global Commission on HIV and the Law has really come up with that. And uh, of course, all sectors really have to play their part, but most important, we are still encouraging our nations to really have sustainability for the AIDS response at country level to meet the, the, the Abuja target of 15%. Uh, of but not only that, that innovation that says, okay, we are going to tap resources, uh, such as all those that we've mentioned, uh, texting alcohol, tobacco, mobile phones, and the Zimbabwe AIDS levy, which is very exemplary, has now been adopted by quite a lot of countries. Okay, to end uh, AIDS, we need mutual accountability. We need to define minimum standards of aged care and be able to monitor how resources are, are, are used, both by the governments, by the partners, and the civil society. So we need transparency, and we need literacy by all stakeholders. You know, it, there is nothing quite as offensive as an advocate who doesn't know. You say to somebody, the Maputo plan of action, and 
They don't know it. Yet they're advocating for sexual and reproductive health services. That is our Bible. If you don't know that, do you know ICPD? No, you wouldn't. So you should at least know the basic instruments that we're advocating with. So we need that. To end AIDS, we need innovation, sponsoring research. And on that point, I want to commend South Africa. South Africa is leading on homegrown research. That is done at home by home researchers. And we need that kind of thing in Africa. Our leaders need to sponsor that. Yes, we can partner, but we need to be able to do that. But a vaccine, we've already talked about it. The quest must be a global effort. We need to improve even our messaging. You know, let me tell you how I, I, I was able to, 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 to get people to use the, con the female condom, or at least to get our MPs to take it. After I launched it as a Minister of Health, they didn't want me to even bring the boxes to Parliament. It was like, this is hallowed ground. You shouldn't bring those things here. So I said to them, well, let me tell you something. For women who have never had an orgasm, when they use this condom, they see God. <laughs> Members of Parliament came and everybody wanted their own box and said, OK, we are going to show our constituents. But I don't know if they were used, but at least they were taken. And that's so we need that kind of messaging. So the message is simple, only shared responsibility and global solidarity among all sectors of society can and aids. And our own executive director, I'm just about to finish, our own executive director has been a real champion in revitalizing Africa at continental level. We have all these bodies, most of them are new. We have um, uh, a, 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 a UN envoy on AIDS in Africa, a daughter of Africa, and we also have for the first time an African Union chair who is a woman, a daughter of Africa. So hey, things are happening in Africa. Watch this space. One day you may be seeing Sheila Klo, President, Republic of Botswana. Woo -hoo! That would be so great. So. This is the roadmap that the, our leaders have agreed on, and it actually is showing how they are going to make sure, use those three pillars to drive you know, you, uh, country ownership, financial uh, responsibility, as well as that global solidarity. But for the three diseases, AIDS, TB, and malaria, I won't go too much into them because people are already going in, but said responsibility and global solidarity simply is saying, people have already said it, that the, the, the developmental model of donor and recipient is changing. We need to identify our own evidence-informed policies, find out how we are going to source them, put funds in there, and then get the partners so that they come in as partners. At the same time, we need more funding. Uh, no country can do this alone. We are not saying that countries should be now be left to their own, on their own. No, and I'm glad of what um, Hillary Clinton just promised us. You know, the country of PEPA has always been the one that stood by uh, the, the, the developing uh, uh, countries. And now we have more partners. This should really be, 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 be that. So with all that, we, um, um, let me just end by saying South, South Saharan Africa remains the center of the epidemic. Our civil society is very dedicated to the 10 targets, and they say it should receive the proportional focus and resources. Yeah. And uh, with all this, we will achieve our vision of zero new infections, zero discrimination, and zero AIDS-related deaths. Thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated for the next session. There are volunteers passing out question cards. If you're here to see the session that starts at 11 o'clock, there are volunteers passing out question 